Hi guys, how you doing? It's Peter Hunt here from Action Point. Um, we're going to get the webinar kicked off in the next couple of minutes. So get yourself comfortable and uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Hello everybody, how are you doing today and welcome to our live virtual event here at Action Point. I'm your host Peter Hunt and um, we're looking forward to what will be a very exciting uh, set of content from today's speakers. Um, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting time of year as we come into Christmas um, and, and look ahead to 2021 and certainly from my own perspective I, th I think it's one with great optimism so I'm hoping that today's content um, will give you plenty of food for thought as we head into uh, 2021. Um, the title of today's event is Modern Work in Action, Productive Minds, Productive Teams and what we've tried to do is we've tried to mend the best of technology with the be best of mental health and wellness um, expertise and research. Um, a quick uh, run through the agenda. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a brief background on the Modern Work in Action series. It's something we've put a lot of thought into um, over the past few weeks and um, it's something we're going to roll out over the, the coming months into 2021. Um, speaker introductions. So um, we've got two, uh, two fairly decorated speakers with us today. So um, uh, excited to hear their thoughts and, and give them a brief over overview. Then we're into the main meat of today's uh, discussion. Um, Finney and Ali um, here at Action Point will cover surfacing the data using Microsoft 365 to find insights. And then um, onto the main event then we'll be acting on insights, people first performance with Caroline Clark of I am here. We'll then break into panel discussion and Q&A. And I guess, look, make the most of this webinar. Um, please do ask our experts all the questions that you have. Um, you can place your questions in the questions box on GoToWebinar and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. Um, Timeline wise, we're looking at about um, about 45 minutes from now. So we we'll finish up around 10 to 2 um, um, when, when all the Q&A has concluded. So I guess a little bit about Action Point because I'm conscious that there's people tuning in from kind of all over Europe today um, and may not have heard of the company. So um, our, um, our mission is to help companies achieve their greatest potential using the power of technology. Um, you know, it's a lofty mission, but what does it mean? I, I guess um, at our core, we do a lot of consultancy and advice. Uh, managed IT services uh, and custom software development. Um, I guess you probably would have uh, maybe interacted with Action Point software um, if you are an Irish citizen and you, and you uh, applied for your passport online or renewed your passport online. Um, if you're an Airbnb customer, um, our IT services actually support Airbnb's um, contact support unit. Um, so, you know, we're, 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 we're wide reaching and we work across different industries, um, both in legals, uh, financial services, sports, um, and, and many other industries as well, including government. So um, that's a little bit on action points. I'm just going to go through, uh, sorry, my uh, my mouse is a little bit sensitive today. Um, I guess the Modern Work and Action series, and I guess why did we come up with it? Um, action points in the last nine months, I guess, we've been heavily involved with remote working and remote working setup. Um, we've had about 10,000 people set up for remote working in the last year. And I guess we've learned a lot in that time. Um, 
initially we it was a technology and communications problem um, it was an applications and and an infrastructure challenge for a lot of companies but what we found and through our research for our remote work and reports was that there, there was more to it than that there was individual performance there was individual wellness there was um stress in the workplace there was there was dealing with 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 massive change management and to that point the modern work and action series came about so the four key pillars in the Modern Work and Action series, people and insights, which we're covering today, security compliance, modern infrastructure, and modern applications. And over the next few months, you'll get a flavor of all of these different topics and areas. And, and we've gotten feedback from our customer base that these are the key areas that, that they're, they're trying to focus on. So if you enjoy today, great. We hope to see you back here again. And um, if, if, uh, if you're listening to this in recording, we hope to see you on an event real soon. Um, and at this point, I'm going to bring, ask our two speakers to come on. So Caroline and Finian, if you'd like to join me on the webinar. Excellent. So um, I'm going to allow each of our speakers to introduce themselves, um, their roles and the content they'll be covering today. So Finian, if you'd like to kick us off. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, my name is Finian Nally. I'm head of Microsoft Cloud Solutions with ActionPoint. I've been in the technology sector for over 20 years. Uh, the the grey hairs and the lack of hair are, are definitely showing now at this stage. And really a large focus of, of my work over the last number of, of months and, and longer even has been speaking with companies about their, their modern working trends, about how they're enabling their workforce to do more with technology. Um, and it's interesting some of the insights that we're going to discuss shortly uh, that have come out of that specifically over the last nine months. Excellent. Thank you, Finian and Caroline Clark, our, 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 our esteemed special guest. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, you're very kind, Peter. Thank you. And uh, hi, Finian. Hello, everybody. Delighted to be here today. So I'm Caroline Clark and I'm Chief Experience Officer of uh, I Am Here. Uh, I'm also a executive and leadership coach, mental health coach and a senior resilience coach as well. So uh, 20 years corporate experience, uh, have always struggled with corporate culture. And I, I guess I made a shift uh, five years ago to really try and influence uh, beliefs and behaviors around value systems, mental health and well-being, human design business. Um, and today what I'm going to do is really think about, you know, the opportunities that 2020 has given us. I'm always a glass half full person. Um, so I'm going to take you through some thoughts on what it means for leadership, the way we work, um, and also around uh, the power of one and the collective as well. And uh, and touching on a little bit of what Finian has, you know, the power that, um, and the opportunity that te technology can play uh, going forward in a very positive way to enable our lives. So yeah, so that's what I'm gonna Fantastic. cover today. Not, uh, not much to cover there at all. No, <laughs> all in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, look, brilliant. Look, we, we'll get the show on the road. So, so Finian, uh, you're up first and um, looking forward to seeing both your presentations and checking back in for our Q&A at the end. Um, Great, Peter. Thanks very much. Uh, can you see my screen? OK, Peter. Perfect, Finian. Great. Yeah, I, I suppose in, in thinking of today's uh, event, um, I kind of thought back over the last number of months, the last nine months, especially the change that has happened on that and try to summarize it into the kind of the four key trends that we're seeing in Action Point across our customer base and beyond. And, and those four key areas that jumped out at me, first and foremost, was the technology overload. I think many organizations will put their hand up and say that the remote working was thrown on them. They were never really prepared for it. And a large part of enabling that remote working was throwing technology at the problem, setting up laptops, webcams, uh, setting up VPNs, setting up new software, be it Microsoft Teams or collaboration software, and pushing that out as quickly as possible to their, to their staff. And what we found in, in speaking with those organizations and in speaking with their staff is that people actually feel overloaded by this technology. Not only was there that a, a initial spike back in March, April timeframe, but the level of continuous uh, innovation and I suppose attempted transformation across many businesses has been very, very disruptive for people and, and they really feel, feel overwhelmed and overloaded by it. And I think a large part of that has been the assumption of knowledge that goes with that. As organizations have enabled remote working and, and this new way of work, we actually assume that people actually know how to use the technology we're giving them. We assume that people know how to do video conferencing very easily, for example, when many people actually don't know, they don't know the, the simple basics of it. We assume people know how to collaborate with files and 
engage effectively with their colleagues in a remote working world. But if we ask, if, as an organization, if we ask ourselves the question, have we actually enabled that? Have we actually gone through a process of, of educating our staff and demonstrating to our staff um, how to use that technology properly? What, what we also found interesting is the value of people's times has, has definitely been eroded. Uh, many people who I speak with are saying that the number of meetings they're attending, the number of virtual meetings they're, they're attending, is pretty much taking up the vast majority of their calendar in the working week. And what they're finding is many of those meetings, they don't know why they're being invited into. Some of those meetings are duplicate of other meetings. People arrive in late to meetings, so often they don't start until five, 10 minutes before the actual start time. And the value of not only my time as an individual, but my colleagues' time has been dramatically dramatically be, been eroded. And that really has a, has a knock-on effect. And I think those three areas definitely build towards the remote working fatigue that we're seeing right now. Personally, I can put my hand up and say, yeah, I'm feeling remote working fatigue. And what I find interesting about that is the surveys that we in Action Point have done, including our remote working survey, and many of the other surveys done out there by, by large um, industry bodies, would see that there's a real appetite for people to continue remote working, but not in the same vein as it's happening right now, to really change the mode on, on that, to address some of the key issues above, but also to adopt a new approach in, in terms of a hybrid approach, maybe two to three days per week from home and an X amount of days back in, in the office. So they're the key trends that, that I'm seeing out there right now. And in, in thinking about that, how do we actually start to address some of these issues? How do we really start to take ownership of those and, and look at, you know, I, I like to break it down into the individual, the team, and the organization. And one of the key tools that in Action Point that we use and the vast majority of organizations that we deal with and come into contact with use is around Microsoft 365. It's the key collaboration tool for many, many businesses using Teams to have conversations or to have webinars like today um, using um, Microsoft 365 to share files and do many, many other things. But what many people don't realize is that there's also a lot of things under the hood that can help you as an individual and that can help the organization gain insight into what's going on. So I'm actually going to go into a little bit of detail about that today. So to look at me first, to look at me as an individual, how can I start taking ownership of my time? How can I get time back? And my analytics is the go-to tool for that. So let me just bring up on my analytics screen and I'll give you some insight into how you can use my analytics and, and what it actually does. The good news is that my analytics is available to everyone. If you're using Microsoft 365 today, you have my, my analytics. It's not an extra feature or anything like that. It's there available to you right now. And what my analytics does is it discovers my habits and tries to help me to work smarter. And for me, you know, I, I've been aware of my analytics for a long, long time, but I've actually only really started to use it in the last number of weeks. And it's allowed me to take control of my time, to, to get time back. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on that as I discuss this. So the four key pillars it builds on are around focus, around well-being, around my network, and around how I'm collaborating. So if I look at my focus, focus for me was something that I, I was really, really bad at in the past. I was guilty of jumping from meeting to meeting, jumping from task to task, uh, reacting on emails instantly. And ultimately, when I got to the end of the week, I realized actually I had very little time to focus on what was important. I had very little time to focus on work, and I found that that ended up bleeding into my evenings, bleeding into my weekends. And, you know, my mind was being dominated by, by work fundamentally. So what I did was I introduced, I looked at focus time and I said, you know what, I'm going to block off time. I'm going to block off time for me to get work done. So the very first thing I did was, was allow focus time to block off two hours per day for me. Every single day that is blocked off in my calendar. No one can take that away from me. And no one can send me a meeting or people can try and send me meetings, but I'm simply going to say, that's my focus time and you know you, we need to schedule another time. So if I look at what's happened here uh, for me, I can see right seven of the next 10 days I have focus time scheduled. One of those days actually needs a review because someone has tried to schedule a meeting with me uh, in one of my focus times. But what, was, what I found really interesting was this insight down here. So during working hours, I read half of my emails within 30 minutes of receiving them. It's something I've known in the back of my mind that I've been doing but now that it's surfaced that key nugget of information to me, I've actually been really conscious of it to say, well, actually, when I'm in focus time, when I'm working on whatever list of tasks I've set myself, I'm not going to react to emails. In essence, I'm going to turn off email. I'm, I'm going to close down Outlook. and I'm going to focus in on the time. So it's something simple that has looked at my habits, looked at how I've worked, and now is allowing me to take back control of that focus time. The next area, and I kind of mentioned it briefly a second ago, was around my well-being. And again, this is something I've become very conscious of. 
like many remote workers, I've been guilty of guilty of not taking lunch breaks or a short lunch break, working into the evenings. The office is always there. I can jump on the laptop in a second. So, you know, I'm on that varying times a day. So if I look at the last four weeks in my own trend, and, and I've really started to think about how I work in, in the last four weeks, back in the first two weeks of November, I can see that I had uh, only two quiet days. So Monday the 9th and Wednesday the 11th were the days where I didn't work outside of normal hours, didn't work outside of nine to half five. Every other day I was pretty much doing something. I was either sending an email in a meeting, sending a, a, an instant message or doing something related to work during that time. What I've done now in the last two weeks is that I've taken back control. I said, you know what, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to take a lunch break. I'm going to go for a run at lunchtime. I'm going to stop work at half five. I'm going to spend time with my kids. And what's interesting as I've become conscious of that is that I've only had two days where I've worked outside of normal hours and my focus has been back into um, the working day. So again, I've, I've taken control of my time. To discuss the network aspect, and this is something I really, really like, and I think it's something that's not only relevant to individuals, but it's also very relevant to managers. The network gives you insight into who you're actually working with. Again, I'm working with a number of people um, 10 to four hours over the last four weeks, which is expected. I, I can see who I'm working with. Yes, I've been working with them on various projects. But I think the real insight for me are, are, is twofold in here. If I'm a manager and I've got a team of 10 or 20 people, what I really want to be conscious of is who isn't in here. Who am I not collaborating with? Who is maybe missing out on the team? Who haven't I had a phone call with in, in the last couple of weeks? And, and are they getting isolated? It's very easy in this remote world that we live in for people to become isolated, to become siloed out. And what my network does is it allows me to see, well, actually, do you know what? I haven't communicated with John in four weeks. Do you know what? I'm going to pick up the phone and check in with him, see what's going on. We may not be working on it on any active project right now, but we still are on the same team. So let me have that piece of interaction. What's also really interesting for me in here is that it's saying that 33% of my active collaborators are outside of my business. So again, that gives me insight to say, okay, in my role, is my job communicating internally with people or should it be more focused on communicating externally with people? Maybe I'm in sales and I should be spending the majority of my time at communicating with customers and engaging with customers but I found out that I've been bogged down by internal meetings and, and internal things, so that actually I'm only getting 33% of my time to actually engage with customers. So what this has done is, is really, it's, it's surfaced up um, information to me to allow me to take action, to say, actually, I'm gonna look at who's in my network and I'm gonna control what I'm doing as well. And the last area just to mention is around the collaboration piece, specifically within my analytics. This allows me to see actually, how am I collaborating? What's actually going on? And looking at this, I, I can see, right, what, what, how, how much time am I spending in meetings? What am I actually doing in those meetings? Are those meetings with high attendance? Are they actually of value to me? And a simple one down here for me personally was, you typically have 20% of your week spent in meetings. So I have to ask my question, right, 20% of, of my week, is that a good thing? Is that a good use of my time? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe I want to increase that, maybe I want to decrease it but it's surfacing the information for me to allow me to inform myself to take proper action. So in thinking about that, in, in thinking about analytics, Peter, I think you might have a poll there. It, it'd be good to understand how many people out there actually do focus, how many people do focus on, on blocking off time in their calendar to, to take action. Peter, I think yeah, you've opened so, up a poll there now. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully we can get a, a few responses in there and there's a few coming in. So the question is, how often do you have time booked in, focus time booked in your calendar? Please select one. Once a week, two days per week, three to four days per week, five days per week, none at all. So I'll just give that 10 or 15 seconds and um, we'll try and get a few responses in and it should feed our, our Q&A at the end, no doubt. So, brilliant. Thanks very much for the responses there, guys. I'll close that down and I'll hand back to Finian. Thanks, Peter. So we've looked at the, at the individual. The next thing we need to look at is the organization. How can us as maybe at the sea level or, or, or higher up in the organization get, get our finger on the pulse? How can we get a handle as to what's actually going on within the organization? In the context of Microsoft 365, which again, many organizations are using, Microsoft have released a new tool called Productivity Score. Productivity score is designed to actually see what's going on in the organization and see how our teams be using the technology that we've given them effectively. How are they using it? You know, should we need to enable them more? Do we need to give them more training? Do we need to advise our managers to, to focus on certain areas? So it's surfacing that data to the top and, and allowing us to take action on that. So I'm gonna discuss some of the aspects uh, within productivity score. 
The first piece I like in particular is around meetings. You know, again, we hear that commentary or anecdotally from, from many people, I'm in too many meetings, I'm attending too many meetings. I, my life has, has been bombarded with meeting requests left, right and center. So if I can use productivity score to look into actually what's the trend in our organization, is that just anecdotal from a few people or is that you know a wider problem within the business? And so, for example, if I look at our, our own organization here, one of the stats that I like is that 37% of people spend 10 hours a week in meetings. So almost 40% of our staff spend more than 10 hours a week in, the meeting, in a meeting. And what you have to ask ourselves is, right, is that effective? Is that good use of people's time? What type of organization do we have? And is there an expectation that they should be spending that much time uh, in a meeting? And, and if it's a case to say, well, actually, do you know what? We as a business, we want to reduce the volume of, of meetings that are happening in the business. We want to encourage people to actually do work and, and, and not be stuck in meetings that maybe aren't relevant. And, and let's set a goal of reducing that down to nine hours per week. What this allows us to do is to take that information to our management team and say, listen, we want to communicate out there. The volume of meetings needs to be reduced or maybe meetings need to be much, much more effective. What productivity score is allowing us to do is to open up that conversation with, with a bit of facts be, behind it. We're also able to see that, right, actually 7% of people uh, initiate meetings from Microsoft Teams channels. Um, so that they're having ad hoc meetings. These are meetings that are not scheduled in calendars. So a very, very small number of people are actually having those, um, those ad hoc meetings. Again, uh, we got to look at our own organization and ask, right, is that a good thing or is it actually a bad thing? Maybe it's a good thing, the fact that the majority of our meetings are actually scheduled in people's calendars. They have time to prepare and very few meetings are just ad hoc uh, on the fly. Another area that's included in, in productivity score is around content collaboration. And again, on, on, on the face of this, you know, we as, as active Microsoft 365 users might look at this and go, yeah, this is great. 70% of people in our organization are collaborating. They're using the technology stack effectively. But what's really interesting for me is that if I look down here at the detail of it, 95% of people share files as an attachment. Now, why that's interesting for me is that we've given the te technology to share files more effectively, to share files using links rather than attachments, but yet only 5% of the organization is using it. So again, this is more insight for us as an organization to say, actually, have we actually shown people this feature set? Have we actually encouraged them to work in, in this way? Have we actually tried to make their life easier? And maybe actually, do you know what? We need to set up a training program to show people how to share data and share among their colleagues more and more effectively. And the last area just to discuss briefly is around Teams itself, Microsoft Teams. And it's something, again, I hear a lot of the, the Teams fatigue element. You know, I'm in too many Teams. I'm in too many channels. There's too many notifications there. Um, it's becoming overwhelming kind of thing. So again, using a productivity score as an organization, we're able to look at things and say, okay, well, what's actually going on in our organization? What's the reality? And one of the numbers that jumps out at me here in this screen is that 18% of shared workspace have a degree of engagement. So that means only 18% of all those teams, channels and, and various teams that we've set up have a level of engagement on it. So the other 72% don't. So what that means is maybe we're not uh, encouraging good hygiene. We're not encouraging people to say, well, if you actually set up a team, you're the owner of that team. When you're finished with it, archive it off, delete it, clear it out of there. Um, when you're actually inviting someone into a team, think about, do you need to actually invite them into a team? Does a team need to be set up in the first place or is there a better way to do it kind of thing? So what this is doing, it's opening up that conversation to say, there, while the technology aspect is very, very good, we now have the information to open up conversation and um, allow people to take better action, allow people to use that technology more effectively. The very last thing I'm going to discuss is, is, is something that we've used very, very effectively within Action Point. And it's something called organization-wide teams. As many organizations have embraced teams, the challenge has been, well, how do we communicate out effectively to our staff? How do we let them know what's going on within the wider business? You know, whether we're hiring someone, whether someone new has joined the business, or whether we're simply having a, a virtual coffee uh, within our team or within the wider organization. So at Action Point, we've used something called organization-wide teams, and we've actually set this up for many of our customers to allow them to surface that information to all employees and allow the employee to grab that whenever they're available to. So for example, we have five channels within in our organization-wide team where we discuss the success, we discuss our initiatives, our sports and social, um, discuss what's going on with them. And we also have our culture and development team as well, where we get the finger on the pulse. So again, we're leveraging that technology to surface information to people and push that information out. So in summary, you know, when I'm thinking about getting back control and, and getting back my time, 
you know, for 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 us, the, the areas to focus in on are my analytics, which is all about me, productivity score, which is about the organization, and lastly, to look at organization-wide teams. And with that, Peter, I'm going to hand back to you and over to Caroline. Brilliant, Finney, and thanks a million. Um, uh, very interesting uh, topic, and I think uh, some very interesting lessons as well from uh, the, the year that was 2020. So excellent. I see a couple of questions coming in, but I'm going to leave them until the panel discussion at the end. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Carol Ann uh, for, for what, what I'm really excited, a presentation that I'm really, really excited about. So over to you, Carol Ann. Thanks a million, Peter. And you're going to have to remind me how to share my screen again. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we actually no, I have it here. Show my screen. Uh, no hassle. I think you're you still have yours on uh Finian. Finian. Yeah, you want to unshare. Brilliant. For anyone uh, tuning so in, well we did me. we did do a tech check yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. So can you see my screen? I can, yeah. If you want to go full screen there, Caroline. Yeah, I'm gonna do phone. that now. Excellent. Um, Perfect. So thanks everybody for joining. I think the one thing I got out of that, Peter, is that I'm not spending enough time focusing on kind of bigger picture stuff, giving myself time to think about things, read great books that enhance my job. So that's the one action I'm definitely going to take from today. So look, um, I won't hold you for too long. So there's just a couple of key insights and some actions that I'd love to talk you through today. And um, just to give you a, a quick synopsis of why I'm here, you probably won't have heard of it. Um, I Am Here is essentially a, a culture changing program that works with the organization to positively disrupt beliefs and behaviors around mental health and well-being. And uh, we have over 850,000 people as part of our movement now after only a couple of years. Um, we are seeing great success, particularly in male orientated companies as well, which surprises a lot of people. And there are more details on our website as well. And I do have a gift for you later on. You'd be glad to hear. So look, when I when I think about um, this year, I think about lots of things. I think about all the things that I've seen um, over the year as we've all kind of moved into that virtual world. I've seen chickens in people's back gardens in Dublin. I've seen cows outside the backyard of other people's houses. I've seen chickens being killed by birds in one call. Uh, we've all had kids disrupt us, well, some of us have, um, you know, doing the the, uh, the homework with the kids, uh, certainly for me, was just catastrophic. Uh, I'm still getting over it. Uh, I have, there are days where I've probably, probably like yesterday, spent 15 hours in front of my computer and done virtual calls. I sound very unhealthy, don't I? Um, I'm definitely the, the person down on the bottom right who wears pajamas a lot of the time, like a newsreader. And it's, isn't it funny that I couldn't find an equivalent picture of a woman? Just saying. Um, and lastly, the postman or post postal operative, as they're called now, has become my uh, only person some days that I ever talk to. And I have to say they've been an absolute saving grace this year. And then you're probably wondering about the, the ball on the top right hand corner and you can probably see me bouncing. This has absolutely saved me this year from back pain. Uh, it's kept um, probably instead of putting on a stone and a half, I've probably put on a stone instead. So that's been kind of my little thing that keeps me moving all day. So it's been my saving grace. And whilst um, while some of this is kind of humorous, uh, you know, it's also been difficult. I've had aging parents. My mom has a, is, is, has been ill for four months. My dad, unfortunately, was ill and passed away three weeks ago. So when you look at the entirety of this, you know, you kind of wonder. And when you compare your own lives with this and what you've all experienced, it's, it's, it's no wonder that we've had any productive minds at all. But actually, we've had an incredible year. And what I wanted to do firstly is celebrate the resilience that everybody on this call and everybody in society has demonstrated over the last year. Um, because these, these are the seven characteristics of a resilient person. And I don't think people realize uh, the gift um, that we've all been given, although it's been hard and it continues to be hard. But we've demonstrated perseverance through, um, you know, all the different stages of lockdown, the different types of locks, 
lockdown and we've just we've just gone on and we've done it um all to 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 prevent uh, the pandemic from spreading we've also demonstrated incredible flexibility uh, both in our work life uh, and also in our um in our personal lives as well we've shown confidence and what i mean there is that um, through tough times, people tend to look a little bit more internally and it can be subconscious and think about well, what are all the strengths that I can bring to this situation to help me not just cope, but thrive and come out the other side. <clears throat> For some people, that has been more evident. So we would have seen, um, you know, our prime minister in, in Ireland uh, going back onto the front line, nurses coming out of retirement, firemen, all the people on the front line. For other people, it could have been more subtle. So, for example, in I'm Here, what we did was we actually offered it to companies for free for six months. And we worked really hard with companies to try and get ahead of the mental health issues that were arising from the pandemic. For others, it was baking for all the neighbours. Um, and for others, it was just a listening ear at the end of the phone. Compassion has been a massive um, component of 2020 for all of us in terms of how we treat each other. There's a little bit more patience, there's a little bit more forgiveness, um, there's a bit more compassionate in conversations. I notice a lot more checking in with people to see how people are at the beginning of Zoom conversations as well. Humour. A, a real one that we use. If you remember uh, in the first lockdown, uh, I actually had to shut down my WhatsApp uh, because uh, there were so many jokes coming in, I actually couldn't concentrate on work. So we're, we're very good at using humor um, in the face of adversity. And honesty and balance are the last two. And honesty is really about, you know, let's let's look at the facts. Um, you know, there's, there was a move to really make sure that people only looked at the news on um, kind of channels with integrity, um, also to try and stay away from social media uh, as much as possible because of fake news and really just uh, look at the facts. And I mean, I know for me, for example, um, I've definitely reduced my social media and equally, I've only ever looked at the news once a day at nine o'clock just to see the headlines. And I've even stopped doing that because it's, you know, I just can't do it at the moment. And then last but not least, it's about balance. And that's really about all of us thinking about the bigger picture, which I think we have because we've all taken personal responsibility and thought about our actions, looking at the bigger picture, um, living in the now, but also thinking about what well, we also need to plan for the future as well. So congratulations, everybody. This is all everybody on this call. And I think from a work perspective, one of the reasons why I'm I'm showing this in terms of everything that we have individuals have have learned over the last few months is that that's created a huge level of trust in the workplace. And I'd like to think that provides us with a massive opportunity in terms of how we evolve. So I think when um, I, I think if bi bi business has actually stood back and really reflected on what we've achieved in this year. Um, you know, as Finian said, we were all throw, a lot of people were thrown into the virtual world. I mean, I've been working in the virtual world for, for, for five years um, and I still found it hard because I was used to going out and about and having meetings and that human connection, um, you know, the whole area of technology, you know, being thrown at us and, and the overload. But what has happened is people have done a bloody good job. Excuse my, my French. Um, and again, I think everybody should take a, you know, clap themselves on, on the back in terms of what we've done. There's a lot of businesses that have done incredibly well this year um, because of the efforts that people have put in because they've demonstrated their resilience. Um, so with, with that in mind then, how do I see kind of the opportunity for the future? I absolutely think there's a, a fabulous opportunity to evolve how we work. And, um, and I can also see the shifts beginning to emerge on how we approach business. But I think there's probably three fundamental drivers to, to this change. I think we need to look back at the pre-pandemic, uh, first of all, where the, st the statistics around engagement were already at an all-time low. And I think what COVID did was kind of bring that to the surface. So Gallup, uh, which you may have heard of, did a, a massive metadata analysis across 82,000 teams. So that was a basis of nearly 2 million uh, employees across 230 organizations and 49 industries across 73 
uh, countries over 20 years. So it was a huge study. And what's come out of it is pre-COVID is that 85% of the global workforce is not engaged or actively disengaged at work. That's a staggering statistic. So there was massive issues even before the pandemic. And I think coupled with, um, with the Harvard Business Review showing that before the pandemic, 40% of the workforce were also feeling isolated physically and emotionally as well. So that tells its own story in terms of the work that needed to be done. Then we need to think about how the, the, the workforce has been forced to change in order to cope for some with the pandemic. And for others, we have to thrive. So there are people that have actually uh, come out of this feeling quite good, um, you know, for all different reasons. And we can't forget about them. And then finally, we need to um, think about the fact that going into the future, and, I, and this isn't about me being pessimistic, this is, you know, we are still living in, in, in a volatile world. It is still slightly uncertain and chaotic. And that also brings a little bit of fear and worry and there's less risk taking. And that can also impact on, on our culture. So uh, we will continue to have to, to, to show our resilience as well. So I think the first point I'd like to make is that we, um, we have to allow people to heal over the, the coming months. The UN and the WHO have already produced data, as have many other countries around the world, in terms of the mental health impact of the pandemic. Um, I, I, some reports have just come out in the UK, for example, um, in terms of 40% you know, of people ha have been touched by mental health issues. People have spent this year uh, concentrating on pushing through uh, the year to come to the other side and, and that data isn't pr pretty. So business has a responsibility um, uh, not to go back to business as usual. So here's a couple of changes that I see happening uh, over the of um, over the coming year and I'm, I'm, I'm obviously advocating as well. So the first one is around visible and conscious leadership. And um, when you see these, uh, these words, you're probably thinking about the CEO or the leader of, of an industry or a company. But the first place I always start about is you. So you've seen that what you can achieve this year. And I always think that people in an organization is a little bit like, like uh, Finian was talking about in terms of the individual, the team and the organization. So if you think of a small model called me, us and it, so it's really thinking about within your organization, you know, what are the changes that I would like to make going into the future, going into 2021, you know, and, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in terms of what does work look like for me? What does life work like for me? And try to change those habits um, slowly but surely uh, and consciously and getting the support of others. And again, I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, and then it's thinking about, well, what does that mean for my team? And maybe getting together with your team and saying, well, what are the changes that we want to, to make as a team? And what's our legacy going to be? And how do we want to work as, as a group? I always remember when I took a job in, in 2011 with Coca-Cola, I was heading up um, experiential and digital and uh, I was traveling three days a week. I had a two-year-old and a six-month-old. And I always remember um, my husband once asked me, um, you know, would you think about not traveling on Wednesdays because I have a meeting? And I was going, sorry. Uh, I was like, uh, like I'm finding it very hard to, to look after my own life. And I said to him, look, how many of your um, work colleagues, um, both parents are working? And he said, well, I suppose 90% of them. And I said, how many of them, um, you know, have kids? And he said, probably 80% of them. And I said, well, do you not think that all your male counterparts, like you could cut, you, you could basically create your own uh, boundaries and then maybe sit with the team and talk about, well, look, 90% of us, uh, both partners are working, we all have kids. So maybe having that meeting at half eight in the middle of school run isn't a good idea on a Wednesday. So we all have the personal uh, power to make um, leadership decisions on our own. But then when we move up to kind of the, the the level I was talking about at the start, which is around the CEO or the leadership team, what what would we like to see for them or what are the shifts that I'm actually seeing? So the first thing is that leaders need to reflect 
on the, the impact that um, COVID has had on themselves. Self-awareness and resilience, and I mean thriving, not coping, is, is key to lead. If you're not looking after yourself and if you haven't dealt with any potential impact, you'll be unable to, to um, look after an organization. And I often ask my first question when I go into a room full of uh, execs, I say is, you know, how many of you have struggled this year? And every single one of them put their hand up. And then I then I go into kind of the, okay, well, what are we going to do about that? So it is important that they take ownership of, of their own mental health and well-being. The second thing that uh, leaders need to do is recognize the impact of on the workforce efforts. So thinking about your business as being, you know, resilient. So what is, you know, looking at it as almost like a battery and test that battery to adjust in a positive way. And I'll talk a little bit later about how technology can help on that. And I know Finian has talked about that as well uh, today. And then the other big area, which I think is, is the hardest, um, but it's manage, manageable, is shifting from shifting focus, I guess, from profit, productivity and shareholder gain underpinned by HR policies and governance to businesses where all the needs of their workforce is understood and matched. So thinking about self-actualization of your team members um, as a lever for change. And there are companies out there that are doing that already. So the likes of Just Capital uh, run an index of this where, you know, they fundamentally believe that profit comes from looking after your people or what's important to them. And they're producing amazing reports if, if anybody's interested in them. There's lots of books out there that leaders are now reading, such as um, Conscious Leadership by Natasha Wallace, Humans at Work as well. And I have another one here somewhere, but I can't see it. But they're, I'm reading reading three books around kind of, oh yeah, making work human. So there's definitely a shift there. And then two last points there, collective reflection on development of company values to underpin your culture. So <clears throat> leaders need to actively live their values in a visible way to match people's expectations because people are looking for a little bit or more purpose or the why of why they're working for particular organizations. So they need to be actively living those and also celebrating others who do the same. And then finally, and most importantly in, in my world is to put well-being at the heart of their organization. Well-being is a cultural mindset to maximize employee engagement. It is not a, a series of disjointed programs and tools and tactics. It is absolutely a cultural mindset. A thriving workforce is a thriving business. And there are companies that are doing that. And if I even think about the companies we're working with at I'm here, we've got GFG, CISC, TLI, all male orientated organizations. GFG is steel, mining, recycling. The CEO has put mental health and wellbeing and it's his number one focus for the next year across 30,000 employees across the globe. CISC uh, Construction have done the same. TLI utilities have done the, the same. Woolworths in Australia, 200,000 people have done the same. They've publicly stood up and said that mental health and well-being is their number one focus. And they've said that they want every single one of their competitors to take on I am here and publicly claim that well-being is going to be part of the infrastructure of their companies. So it is happening. You look at the likes of Falsha Ireland, who we're also working with, not only are they looking after the mental health and well-being of their own 400 team members, they're offering I am here and help and support to 400,000 people in the tourism industry. So it's not just about work, but it's also on the impact of, of, of uh, on, on the community as well. Nearly finished, I promise. Um, and maybe this is a good time quickly just to do the poll, the poll Peter, just, just to get an idea of, um, you know, people's attitudes to uh, how their companies are dealing with mental health and well-being. No problem. I'll just uh, load it up. So just give me a sec. Excellent. So the poll, um, how would you rate your organization's mental health slash employee wellness plan in 2020? Uh, it's a rating from one to five, uh, five being exemplary and one being non-existent. So uh, if you could get your answers in there, we're really curious to see what's happening out there. 
And I'm conscious yep. there's leadership, there's uh, entrepreneurs out there, a, a lot of um, maybe maybe middle management and staff on, on this webinar as well. So it'll be interesting to see um, what the what the spread of answers is like. So I'll just give that another 10, 10 seconds or so, and uh, we can close it down then. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Caroline. Okay, thank you. Some interesting stats there. Um, <clears throat> I think, though, what we will see is, I mean, there will be a shift and more concentration on that in the future. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's a lovely segue into collective culture change. So going back to thinking about the power of one and what we we're talking about, um, the leadership team can drive cultural change and they can sponsor it. Um, around a thriving workforce and to make sure that we all have a productive mindset. Um, but using the power of one, we can also live it and advocate it. So really it's about thinking about, you know, how can, you know, having a company where there's a culture of care, safety and support, support for the whole person, um, as well and then what are the actions that we're going to do so when we when we work with companies we try to identify champions across the business who are passionate about mental health and well-being or collective cultural change and we give everybody a role in the organization to do that based on where they're they're working because this is about the collective it is not the roles and responsibilities of any one person when it comes to uh, each other's well-being it is absolutely all our responsibility and we give you the tools to do that and with that in mind, we are gifting everybody on this call um, access to our e-learning modules of I Am Here, which will give you the courage, confidence and skills to show you care, ask a question and call for help should you need it. Um, and all you need to go to is our website. And you're very, we're very happy for you to share it with your family and friends because this isn't just a skill set for the work. It is also a skill set for your family and your friends. And uh, ultimately um, helping people deal with their daily mental health and well-being issues. Uh, tapping into some of the things that Finian said quickly, flexibi work flexibility is here to stay. And really the key, there's a couple of things here on this, is that um, we know that um, you know it's here to stay. We know that 98% of employees want to keep some form of home working post-crisis. There's a four-day week concept that's very popular um, in Asia and New Zealand at the moment. They've tested it in Japan and, um, and New Zealand in in Microsoft, for example, in Japan, they saw an increase of productivity by 40% when they tested the four-day week. And the whole concept of the four-day week was really around um, the fact that we're all jam-packed at weekends. So we spend our lunch times during the week doing jobs. We spend all weekend doing jobs. And people can come to work exhausted on a Monday. Um, and that also depends on where you are in your life uh, as well. So the idea is that you get one day a week just for you, for self-care, for focus, for dreaming, for just go and get your hair done, but it is essentially about you, which then uh, means that uh, you can be more productive in work. So watch this space there. So it's not just about working from home. The other thing is that um, you've got to think about, even in the next year, creating your own ideal work because, you know, some people want to go to work for a mental break. I know my sister who works part time goes, you know, I'm going to bed. I'm going. I can't wait to go to work because, you know, I need a mental break from everything. Um, others, the thought of going into a physical space is difficult. So it is all about creating your own plan. And to do that, you need to work with your employer, your line manager, and your team to understand their needs to match your own. Um, based on your dynamic. The other thing is you need to manage expectations. So if expectations aren't met, it can cause friction. So be clear on these and then show flexibility when being flexible too. And then creating boundaries and parameters with those you work with. So a bit like Finian there was kind of, how can you use technology to do that? So for example, in CISC, now if you send them an email at five o'clock, you get one back going, thank you for your email, but as a company, we don't respond to any emails after five o'clock. Um, so there are boundaries that you can do and use technology to do that. And then see, seek feedback more often. So move to a coaching model versus yearly appraisals. Um, and then last but not least, um, and I am keeping an eye on time, don't worry, Peter, this is the last slide. Um, technology should enhance human connections, not replace it. And see, 
um, in our hybrid working world, technology is and can be a very good friend and it's about ab avoiding the pitfalls. Um, and ultimately, I do see technology as means of human connection and deepening relationships. Um, and uh, Finian touched on that. But a few things come from the field from me as well. So think about meetings that you go to in a physical world. There is chat at the water cooler, there's coffees, there's face to face uh, communications, debates, discussions and even fun. Um, and we don't need to lose all that. So look at the picture in front of you, right? And what do you see? On the right, you see lots of engagement, you see laughter, you see emotion, um, and they're having a good time. And if you look on the left, it's basically the back of everybody's heads. So what I want people to think of is the next time when you go to a video call, turn on your video, because it creates human connection uh, automatically. Dress like you'd go to a meeting. Think about the people uh, at the meeting and making them feel comfortable. I mean, I, I've just come off another call to 70 people and I think there was two people with their with their uh, videos on. And uh, I would never go in and r run a workshop where everybody would turn their back on me. So be kind to the people that, that you're working with. Uh, have a coffee together and show you care and check in. And also we play tricks with each other sometimes uh, uh, um, in the call. So bring that element of fun. Just think like you are if you were in work. So it is definitely a mind shift change. And what's really important to me is leverage the platforms based on your needs at work and think about the different relationships that you have that foster connection. So for example, we use Teams uh, at I'm Here. We love it as our central hub for collaboration, for CRM um, and, uh, and obviously client meetings, etc. And we also use WhatsApp for fun stuff. So we have a couple of things going. We've got a happy feet thing. So instead of an exercise program, it's called happy feet. And that ends up being just a place for fun and lots of videos and photos and just having the crack. We have a, a millionaire wheel that goes every Monday to see who's won a prize. Uh, and we have a bit of fun. We do true false things on it um, and we also do informal chats and uh, and I also have WhatsApp chats with my clients as well because for informal chats or in for inspiration and then use technology to reach out to show you care and that's not just about internal or external so you know Finian talked about the network piece and um, you know how you can leverage that to reach out. So, you know, think about the person that's really quiet that you don't really get to talk to. How are they feeling? Um, use your chat box in Teams and in meetings or create a praise channel for winning business or celebrating someone living the values or good news. And if, um, and if anybody is in, interested in any virtual tips on working um, and compassionate connection, let me know because I have those as well. And then finally, use the data from technology to tell you how your teams are. And again, I think Finian used some lovely examples there um, about using data to inform your choices as a business around well-being, work practices and support systems because productivity isn't just about output. Productivity is all about engagement and if your team aren't engaged they're not going to be productive. We know that engagement is, to, is, is uh, costing businesses three times more than absenteeism now. So when, if, for example, you're looking at productivity overall, and maybe this is a question for Finian is, how do you look and see if there's patterns around, um, if there's low engagement? And then thinking about, well, what are the symptoms? Why is this happening? Um, and then getting to the root of the issue and fixing those. Um, pull surveys, team surveys, t system analytics, um, um, all help there. So a whirlwind uh, little chat there. I, I hope it added some value. We, we covered off quite a few topics there in terms of you know, the, the impact of, of COVID, uh, what that's done in terms of trust, our resilience, the opportunities for the future, uh, the role of leadership, our own kind of power of one and collective culture change, 
uh, flexible uh, work and also the role of technology. Uh, last but not least, uh, do join the tribe. Help us change beliefs and behaviours around health and well-being. One person, one company, and one community at a time. And there's the our website there. You can go into our programmes and our demo site, where we'd be very happy to share the 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 online element with you as a Christmas gift. So thank you very much. I can breathe now. Fantastic. Well done. Um, a brilliant presentation, Caroline, and uh, well done for covering such a broad selection in such a short space of time. So I appreciate that. Um, guys, I, I hope we can, uh, I hope for people listening, we might hang on just for a few minutes because I want to get to some Q&A um, and maybe open this up as a little bit of a panel um, for, for Finney and, and Caroline. So um, I'll jump to the polls in a second, but I just have a, a quick question from Tiago uh, for Finney. Finian, do you think the individuals and organizations expected to use productivity dashboard understand it and how to use it correctly? I suppose the straight answer to that one is no. And, and it's, it goes back to that point around the assumption of knowledge. I think it's, while a lot of these tools are great, if, if you don't sit down with a specialist in, in the area and understand how to use them first and foremost, but then how yeah. to use them in your organization, uh, they're simply not going to work for you. And, and it's just going to be lots of nice graphs and fancy charts but completely irrelevant so it, it's about engagement with a partner and it's something we at Action Point do very well. Yeah I think it's a really good point we've actually we have a meeting every two weeks with our IT where they go through different features of teams and all the tools that we have internally to to, to, do, to do the how because I think you're absolutely right um, I think it's all about how you change, change behaviours through action really isn't it and, and helping people understand what's at their fingertips. Good answer. Thanks, guys. Um, Carl, uh, Caroline, a, f a question for you. Um, I feel that a lot of companies still put the onus on staff to put their hand up when they have a mental health issue, which is a significant shortcoming as it may require an active rather than passive strategy. It's actually not a question. It's more of a, more of a statement, maybe one for discussion. But um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think um, there's a couple of insights that we've brought together, actually, and I'm here. One is that we all innately want to help each other and we don't know what to do, particularly in the work environment, because um, people feel that there might be negative repercussions because of that in terms of labeling, career progression. And equally, on the other side, um, you know, we've to to. Um, and also people don't want to help either because of, of lots of different reasons. So it is about merging those and that's really down to the cultural shift. So we spend a lot of time with leadership teams in terms of helping them through that cultural shift to provide that safe, supportive uh, environment for people to express how they feel early and often because what we're, what we're trying to do is prevent the a crisis um, and ultimately get to a, a, a thriving environment and we're kind of at a tipping point now and we need to get over that tipping point where mental health I, I would I would love to see well-being not even featuring in the vernacular in five or six years where it really is about human design business where we're just looking at all you know from um, the kind of survival through to self-actualization and how we run the business that way. So it's just something that we do actively that we look after mental health and well-being on a daily basis. Yeah, it's a very interesting. Um, it's actually a very interesting concept, um, wellness and well-being by design. Um, I kind of have a question for both of you. So you've introduced some interesting concepts. Um, I guess how much of Finney and I suppose you first, if we look at my analytics and we look at productivity score, how much onus is on the individual to surface these insights and, and, and enact these things? And I guess how much onus is on the organization to, to set these standards um, from a strategic level? Yeah, I think it's twofold, Peter. I think it's it's kind of similar to my last answer. Number one is an awareness aspect. We we got to make people aware that that these tools are here. I think it, it also the middle management element to this is very significant as well. As managers, we got to encourage our staff to to use it. We got to demonstrate that we're actually using it ourselves. Um, and, and that does come, you know, not only at a middle management level, but as Caroline said earlier on, straight from the top as well. If, if we're the ones demonstrating that we're using this tools, that, you know, I, I mentioned how I use it myself, that I've I've changed my mode from, you know, going through lunch breaks and, and just working through lunch breaks to saying, right, I'm going to actually stop here. I'm going to go out for a run. I, I'm going to stop at half five. I'm going to do this. So I've started to use that to take control as well. But without the awareness there in the first place, it's easy to slip into a mode and, and go, how am I going to address all of these problems, you know? And, and just before I bring Carl Ann on, I might just share the results of the poll because I, I just think it's quite interesting. Um, so the question was, how often do you have focus time booked into your calendar? 
Um, so look, we're, we're seeing some people um, booking booking time between two and four days per week, about 44% of uh, respondents there, uh, once a week, 6%. But uh, astonishingly, nearly two, two-fifths of the of the audience today, none at all. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. It's a very easy thing to do. It actually, odd. I've I've started using my analytics since since lockdown began, um, and uh, the calendar booking functionality is fantastic. It just books it automatically for you, um, and you can you can adjust it uh, to, uh, to 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 suit your needs. So, um, are, are you surprised to see those results, Finian? Not really, to be honest, Peter. I think it's you know the. The mentality with, with everyone in, in this day and age is trying to get the job done and and that's by no means negative it's, it's that people are genuinely trying to get their job done so yeah. you know while there might be a level of awareness out there to take the time to actually go and say yes i am actually going to set this up in the first place or i am actually going to realize there's a problem in the first place often hasn't happened has an entered mindset for many people because they're just struggling through the day i need to get the job done i need to deliver i need to keep the lights on you know yeah, yeah. Very yeah, I think people end up in the weeds and uh, like we've noticed that ourselves, we were spending way too much time when we looked at the analytics in meetings and a particularly a particular department was struggling because they were just living day to day and not getting ahead of things. And, uh, you know, we've had to review all that in the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, so the, it's what you do with the data that's important, isn't it, Finian? Absolutely. Um, Caroline, I'm just going to pull up uh, the poll around your talk as well. I mean, yeah. we, can, we can use this as a discussion point, but um, how would you rate your organization's mental health slash employee wellness plan in 2020? Uh, one being non-existent and uh, five being exemplary. So um, no ones, which is a positive, I think. Um, yeah. And people are kind of middle of the road, you know, the four or five out of 10 mm-hmm. um, uh, rating their, their mental health slash employee wellness plan in 2020. Um, what have you seen on the ground, Caroline? Look, I, I can see a change. I mean, the reality is, Peter, only 9% of the global workforce have um, give access to employee assist programs globally. So the data tells a story. Uh, I think that the main thing is people are not sure how to approach it. So there's a lot of fragmentation out there. So, you know, lots of different um what we call wash and go programs, lots of tools and tactics, but you need a centralized strategy um, and it needs to be part of your business design is really the only way it's gonna actually help. Like I would walk into a company and within 10 minutes, I know whether they're ready for I am here or not, because culturally they'll be ready or they won't. And that is really about how they're designing their business. I do see a shift and I think all the literature that's coming out, uh, you know, the books, there's writers, I think people like me who've been in business a long time, um are, are are helping to change that as well so definitely a shift in for the good and but it's, it's going to take time i'm conscious as well as but i'm a senior manager in an organization i report into a board and, and and there's probably a lot of people out there at the moment as well in, in in a similar situation how do we move wellness and employee well-being away from a cost center conversation and more towards a, a, a almost a profit driver um how do how do we make that shift well the data is already there um in terms like Deloitte says you know for every one dollar you spend on well-being you get four dollars back just capitalism has several reports produced over the last two years so the data is there the problem is nobody's taking action on it uh, so you need to take action on it but people need that so that's why I spend a lot of time with leadership teams like how do we weave it into kind of the day-to-day as opposed to something that sits out there uh, on the left or the right but it's actually integrated as part of the business design again so very much is about it is about um, influencing that piece throughout the organization so it's not it's not fragmented um, and I think we all have to take personal responsibility as well which I know people are fearful from so you just going back to your previous point Finian um like I realized as a senior manager the impact I was having on other people so back to your awareness piece like I was sending emails at two three o'clock in the morning because I was getting flights in the morning but I was getting responses back I mean it was ridiculous uh, the behaviors we had so I a couple of things I did is I made a commitment to my team that I wouldn't send an email past uh, seven o'clock in the evening. And uh, I would just put it in my drafts and send it the following morning. And I also told my boss, because you know people go, well, I can't be sending that to my boss. And I said, well, make a contract with them. Why don't you tell them that you're not gonna send them an email late? 
and will you do the same? So you just create little contracts with each other and then that suddenly impacts on the team and then that filters up and then obviously there's a leadership piece. So I do think part, being aware and taking action yourself and sometimes thinking about your impact on others is a good way to start. It's very, yeah, it's very, it's a powerful, it's a simple thing that can have a big impact. So um, thanks for leaving us with that, Noga Carolan. Uh, no Finian, last, last, last question, and I appreciate everyone for staying on the call. I know we're the last thing between you and lunch. Uh, it's from Kieran, and it, it's something we discussed, I think, when we were prepping for this. But how would you counter the potential Big Brother argument pertaining to productivity dashboard and analytics? Hopefully yeah, I suppose, it, yeah, yeah, it's a topical one at the moment. I suppose with every new tool that comes out that gives insights, and, and the second it gets branded with insights, straight away people jump to the, the Big Brother argument kind of thing. I suppose the, the tools I demonstrated earlier on, uh, firstly, my analytics is, is only available to me, so it's all about me and, and I'm the only one who has access to it. The productivity score tool is, is a brand new tool, still in, in preview, and it's, it's evolving uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. And the beauty of that as well is that it's anonymized, so we're not able to drill into what's actually going on. We're not able to drill into, you know, are people actually working and start monitoring the webcam. But I think that question raises a much bigger question for me, and it's probably something Carolina has experienced in terms of, well, what type of organization do you have? If your organization is a big brother type of organization, is that an organization you really want to work for? Um, and, and I know that successful organizations don't adopt a, a big brother approach. There's that level of trust and that contract with the staff. So I, I think it raises many, many more questions about the organization that you're working with. Yeah, totally. And I think a lot of it is about how you package the message as well. Like if you're talking about the reason why we're doing this is because we're sell we're checking, you know, how we all are. We're we're checking the pulse. And if in, you know, if productivity, you know, is if there's an issue there, we've got to look at the symptoms as a whole because that will impact on your engagement and your well-being. So I think it's the messaging and the and the communication. Like Workday, for example, do a pulse survey every Friday. Um and they've got so much data now, it's it's amazing. But they use the data every week and then they form patterns and then that helps them define what what they need to create um as their business for their with their people at the heart. Um and it's something that, that I'm, I've talked to them about a bit. I think it's it's a fantastic initiative and it's all for the good of the people. So I think you know it's the type of organization, you're absolutely right. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much for both of your time. Caroline, can you um, just unshare your screen? I am uh, I want to just oh. pop up a slide. Uh, I had done that, but... Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so we should be good to go. Um, so, perfect. Uh, Finian, uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, you're yeah. good. Perfect. Okay, yeah, just to wrap up, guys. So, um, look, um, we have, uh, thank you very much, first of all, to our speakers, and thank you very much for everyone on the call for, for, for hanging on to the end. Um, I think it was worth um, spending the time. I think we've covered so many interesting concepts, both on the technology level um, and on the employee strategy level as well. Um, so, really, really thank you very much to both of our speakers. Um, just coming up, I guess, um, as I spoke about earlier, this is part of a series. So um, on Jan 21st, we will um, we will uh, look at business anywhere, business everywhere, and we'll be looking at desktop as a service and how we deliver applications across our organization. So one for both C-suite and the IT manager, um, and, and so definitely want to tune in for that. On Feb 10th, then we look at hybrid working, uh, secured and simplified. So this is where we pull you know all of the insights and learnings that we've had over the year of remote working that was 2020, um, and uh, bring it all together into uh, into into a, into a short and concise presentation. So definitely worth checking out. Um, you're on our mailing list, so we will we will send you details of this in the coming weeks. So just keep an eye out for that, and you can follow us on social media as well. Um, just a quick one on our offer. Um, again, more more information on this in the after um, in the after presentation email. Um, we're working. We're, we're scheduling some modern work and action half day workshops. So um, we're going to explore one of four teams in that workshop. So people, security, infrastructure, or applications. Um, the normal price is one thousand euros. But if you speak to us before this Friday close of business, um, you may qualify for fully funded workshops. So. Have a think about that after the webinar. Um, we'll uh, we're, we're, give us a call or or, or, or shoot us a message um, uh, by email, um, and we'll be reaching out to you after this workshop anyway. So um, hopefully it's something of interest, and um, if you qualify, you, you get a fully free workshop that'll be scheduled in January. 
So um, I'm going to I'm going to stop talking now and uh, uh, once again just thank everyone on the webinar, both speakers and attendees, um, for what has been a very uh, enjoyable and insightful um, afternoon's content. And uh, we hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Take care of yourselves.